In the last legislative session at Queen's Park, there was but one lone Green Party of Ontario MPP. And if you watch the Ontario leaders debate, you would have seen him make history as the first fourth party leader to take a place on that stage. Mike Schreiner has led his party since 2009 and in the last election became the first Green to sit at the Pink Palace. He's hoping to have a larger caucus after this election. Mike Schreiner is running for re-election in the riding of Guelph and he joins us now. It's good to see you again. Hey, Steve, it's always a pleasure it's to been, be here. It's been a whole 12 hours, I think, since yeah, I've seen you. Yeah, I was just here. <laughs> uh, okay, you did make history, as we suggested last night, in as much as uh, this was the first time in a province-wide televised debate that there were four leaders on stage instead of three. What do you think you brought to that debate stage that was different enough to warrant your inclusion this time? Well, first of all, I believe we earned our inclusion. The debate consortium said you have to elect an MPP and you need to have a full slate of candidates and we accomplished that and made history last night. But I think I brought a level of honesty and authenticity to the debate that was really appealing to viewers and I think that's been a big part of the feedback I've received. And I also think there were some issues that were brought up last night that maybe wouldn't have been talked about as much. One, the climate crisis, which I think I was the only leader to really talk about it until the very last question that you brought up towards the end of the debate. And the other one is poverty. Hardly, it, nobody else really talked about poverty until I brought up the fact that the Ontario Greens are looking to double social assistance rates to end legislative poverty in this province. And those are two important issues that I think need to be a part of the political conversation here in Ontario. Uh, people are going to be considering over the next period of time, couple of weeks, who they want to put their ex beside on election day. And as they, I do hear this when I'm out there on the hustings. I hear people say, why should I vote for Green? You guys aren't going to be the next government. Is it a wasted vote? Could you address that to people who are wondering whether it is a wasted vote to give it to you? It's not a wasted vote to vote for the Ontario you want. If you want green, vote green. And we've seen what a huge influence even one green MPP can make. Many media commentators, I think maybe even including yourself, Steve, have said I punch well above my weight at Queen's Park and have an outsized influence. Imagine what we can accomplish with two or three green MPPs. And we've seen that in other provinces. So British Columbia, three green MLAs held the balance of power in a minority government in PEI. The Greens are the official opposition in a minority government. So we believe we have an opportunity to maximize our influence to improve the lives of Ontarians. Can you give us one issue where you think your being in that legislative chamber made a difference to what otherwise might have happened? Yeah, you know, Doug Ford uh, proposed a ministerial zoning order to build an Amazon warehouse on the Duffins Creek wetland. I immediately spoke out against it and really led and sparked a citizens movement against it until that ministerial zoning order was pulled. I'll give you one other example. In the early days of the Ford government, they said they were gonna reopen the Greenbelt Act and potentially allow development in the Greenbelt and review the Clean Water Act and partly undermine the Clean Water Act. Again, the, literally the minute that legislation was introduced, I was up at Queens Park speaking out against it. And again, we built a citizens movement and the Ford government backtracked on that schedule of the bill and said, you know what? Hands off development in the Greenbelt. And quite frankly, other than Mr. Ford wanting to build his highways through the Greenbelt, they have said nothing about doing development in the green belt, and I think it's because of a firm opposition led by one green MPP. Well, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to watch the debate because you were there, <laughs> but here's a little bit of it. Sheldon, if you would. The Bradford Bypass. Just when a golf course buddy, donor, said, hey, golf. we don't want it through our golf course, he rerouted it around them. He will roll out the red carpets for the Amazons of the world and the big box stores of the world. But when it comes to supporting local farmers, he'll pave over their farmland, hurting our economy. Oh, I, when it comes to protecting us from flooding from and the, the climate change, he'll, he'll pave over the wetlands that clean our drinking you know, water and protect so, Mr. us. First time, were you nervous? <laughs> I was a little nervous going into it, I'll have to be honest with you, but I think a little nerves are good because it uh, keys you up and gives you the energy you need and sometimes the focus you need on what you want to accomplish when you're on the stage. I was impressed about the fact that when I asked that question at the end about what's the decision you regret the most in public life, frankly, you were the only guy who really <laughs> gave a thoughtful, <laughs> heartfelt answer about wishing you had run in Guelph from the beginning as opposed to all the way along. You didn't get a heads up on that question. Right? So where'd that no. come from? You know, it came from the heart. <laughs> I would say almost everything I said last night came from the heart. And I think people are hungry for a politician who's authentic and is honest. And, you know, just saying that, you know, I made a strategic mistake in the 2011 election, and I learned from that mistake. 
And now you're the MPP and for Guelph. And now well, I'm the MPP for, MPP for Guelph. <laughs> seeking re-election there. <laughs> Let's talk about your platform. And Sheldon, if you would, can we bring this graphic up? Because the Greens, of course, it's been many years since they were only a party about the environment. They have lots of other things on offer as well. For example, a desire to increase mental health spending to 10% of the health care budget. They'd hire 15,000 nurses. Increase funding to home care services by 20%. Cap class sizes for kindergarten at 26 and from grades 4 to 8 at 24. Close the health outcome gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous populations. Double ODSP, the Ontario Disability Support Program rates, and tie future increases to the rate of inflation. Cut public transit fares in half for three months. Fund retrofits for provincially owned buildings. Implement congestion charges. And to make business carbon free, include output based pricing. And I want to start with that last one, because I got a feeling that is hugely important and that <laughs> nobody understands what it means. So what's an output based pricing system? Yeah, so basically when you bring in carbon pricing, you have certain industries that are particularly what would be called trade exposed. So they compete in global markets and we might lose those businesses to other jurisdictions. Like what, steel? Cement, cement, cement. is a classic okay. example when the BC carbon price was brought in. So you make adjustments in the carbon pricing to rebate money back to those companies to help them do things in the case of cement, fuel switching to you know, uh, become fossil fuel free or in the case of steel, moving to electric arc furnaces. And so it's a way to recognize that you want those businesses to survive and not go somewhere else. And how would you help them do that? Yeah, by returning rebate money to them to, so they can do things like be able to afford to bring in um, electric steel arc furnaces, for example, or to allow for fuel switching in the, in the cement sector uh, so they can drive fossil fuels out of their heating processes. Any sense about how much that would cost? Yeah, you know what? Uh, the exact details for each one, uh, I, I'm not going to tell you that because I don't know their businesses, but you know, in some cases it's looking at hundreds of millions of dollars for sure. And can they afford to do it? Absolutely. You're already starting to see it happen with Defasco Steel, for, for example, and the cement industry has been coming to Queen's Park for years now, even just asking for regulatory changes for, that would enable them to do fuel switching, even without the financial incentives and supports. Now, in some respects, the debate last night was between the three opposition people and Doug Ford. But in another respect, last night's debate was also to kind of figure out who was going to be the champion of the progressive parties, right? Which has nothing to do with Ford, but everything to do with Horvath, Del Duca, and Schreiner. So let me ask this. All of you three progressive parties are kind of pitching many similar things. More nurses, more teachers, retrofitting homes, building more schools, uh, a break on public transit, um, uh, subsidizing the purchase of electric vehicles, and you bikes as well, uh, cleaning up the environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, how does the Green Party distinguish its offer from what the other two parties are also pitching, which in many cases is very similar? Yeah, it's leading with new solutions to old problems. And, you know, sometimes I've joked in the past, probably in some interviews with you, Steve, where I've said, you know, the other parties can, you know, steal some of our ideas because we're about getting things done to improve the lives of the people of Ontario. I don't think I've ever seen stealing of ideas in real time like I've seen over this campaign. What do you mean? And let me give you a couple of examples. So we were the first to put out a housing affordability strategy that Toronto or Canada's largest circulation daily newspaper called a masterclass plan in delivering the housing affordability solutions Ontarians needs. I believe the NDP now has updated their platform three times to try to match what the Greens are doing. Mr. Del Duca has said, you know what, the Greens had in his convention speech, the Greens have the best housing strategy, we might as well just adopt most of it. Now, unfortunately, neither one of those two parties have gone as far as we've gone, but they've certainly adopted many elements. We're the first party that brought forward a standalone mental health strategy in Ontario's history. Not too long after that, the NDP brought one out, almost matching us, the only difference being we told people how we would pay for it by canceling Doug Ford's license sticker gimmick and using that money to fund mental health. The NDP wasn't quite so clear about that. And then we came out um, early in the, well, actually I've been calling for over a year now, but we came out aggressively in the campaign calling for the doubling of social assistance rates to end legislative poverty in Ontario. Poverty costs this province $33 billion a year to force people to literally live in the case of people with disabilities, on $1,100 a month. It's simply impossible. We've moved all three parties on this one. Even Doug Ford, who brought out a budget a few weeks ago, freezing social assistance rates, 
was forced to say, you know what, we'll raise them 5%. I think the Liberals have said 10% and 10% for a total of 20. Mm -hmm. And the NDP once again amended their platform going from, I believe it was a 20 to 40% increase to now matching us, not in the first year, but in, in the second year. I mean, we have seen in real time over the last year, as we've all been gearing up for this campaign, what a huge influence the Ontario Greens are making will continue to make, and that's exactly why we need more green MPPs at Queen's Park. Do you have the luxury of being able to sort of open that Overton window even more? Because as you yourself have acknowledged, you're not going to be the next Premier of Ontario, so you can, you can make promises that are not necessarily rooted in reality. That's an unfair way to put it, but you know <laughs> what I'm getting at. We can offer bold promises that are rooted in reality. And I would say, for instance, our climate plan is the most detailed most ambitious yet doable plan that any political party in Ontario has ever brought forward to show how we can cut climate pollution in half by 2030 and be fully net zero by 2045 using existing technology. So there's no pie in the sky, oh, if we develop this innovation or, or that innovation, we'll solve the crisis. We've actually shown how we can do it through detailed modeling in ways that can help people save money by saving energy and in ways that can set Ontario up to be a global leader in the emerging markets of the new climate economy, which many economists are predicting there's going to be 75 million jobs created in low carbon, new climate economy industries between now and 2030. The question is, will Ontario lead or will we will follow? We believe Ontario is well positioned to lead if we have the political policies in place like what the Greens are offering. There are 124 MPPs at Queen's Park, and you were the only one to vote against the license sticker rebate. And, well, okay, a couple questions emerging out of this. Why? Because it makes absolutely no sense to give um, people a break on their, on their license plates in a way that disproportionately benefits wealthy households who own lots of vehicles and drain billions of dollars out of our public treasury that need to go to health care, education, and fixing affordable housing. The pandemic has revealed significant cracks in the foundation, particularly of our systems of care in Ontario. We have to fix that foundation, not paper over it. We're going to need resources to do that. And, you know, giving car drivers a break when... Um, you're not giving non-car drivers a break. You're not giving people who can't afford to own a car a break. You're not giving people who maybe for environmental reasons uh, don't have a car a break. Most Ontarians I've talked to, and we're talking conservative, liberal, NDP, across the political spectrum, feel offended. I call it a gimmick. You call it a rebate. <laughs> but most of the people I've talked to said, and what I've replied to them saying is, we want to earn your vote, not buy your vote. And people see through these kinds of election gimmicks. I think the NDP and the Liberals actually agree with you on the substance of the thing, but we're terrified at the politics of the thing. That if they didn't back up this tax rebate slash gimmick, let's use both of our expressions, uh, that uh, Doug Ford would call them out on it and they would be politically vulnerable. Why don't you feel the same way? Well, he called me out on it last night during the debate. He said on more than one occasion that, you know, Mike Schreider wants to raise taxes and fees on people. And, you know, I was very clear in the debate, and I've been very clear since then, that we're going to ask upper income Ontarians to pay a bit more. And that's for, you know, people who earn over $200,000 a year. It's people who maybe have the ability to afford six or seven cars. It's the people who um, are of high incomes and are getting electricity rebates. We're saying, you know what, you should pay a little bit more so we can fix the foundations of our systems of care that were particularly revealed during the pandemic. We owe it to elders to fix long-term care and ensure that we put people before profits. We owe it to healthcare workers to treat them with the dignity and respect and the fair wages they deserve so they can care for us. We owe it to young people in this province to ensure that we have properly funded um, public schools. We owe it to a whole generation of young folks who are wondering if they'll ever be able to afford a home to have a housing affordability strategy. And we're saying that the billions that Ford removed from the provincial treasury with the license plate sticker gimmick should be there to fund the things Ontarians want and need. You mentioned the electricity rebates, and I want to raise that with you, because I've talked to a number of guests on this program about that. And I'll set it up by saying this. I earn a six-figure salary, and Toronto Hydro sends me a check for nine bucks every month to help me pay my electricity bill. Now, I don't happen to think that makes any sense at all. This is a policy brought in by the previous uh, government of Kathleen Wynne. Um, 
How much do we subsidize? What does the taxpayer subsidize electricity? It's like six, seven billion a year, isn't it? Something like that? Six point nine billion dollars a year, which just once again shows you how these election gimmicks, because in some ways you could argue the liberals brought that in as an election gimmick mm -hmm. to deal with the fact that rising electricity prices were a political threat to them, how these the costs associated with these balloon out of control. We're now spending six point nine billion dollars a year for the CEO of Rogers, the CEO of Hydro One, the host of the agenda to um, get a, a, a check back. The IS, the Financial Accountability Officer, did do an analysis by demographics on this. Wealthy Ontarians receive a 30% higher on average benefit than low and middle income Ontarians do on these rebates. So we're saying keep supports in place for people who live in rural communities because we know prices are higher there and in remote communities and keep the subsidies in place for low and middle income Ontarians but upper income earners they can pay their electricity bill especially when there are so many people in our province who don't even have a home to live in right now. This seems obvious to me on the face of it and yet I see none of the parties except for you running on the issue of Means testing is probably not the, word, not the right word, but you can come up with a better expression for that. Uh, making it geared to income on paying uh, subsidies on electricity. Why is nobody running on this? You'd think actually a populist premier would want to run on something like this. Why isn't it happening? It seems like it'd be the perfect thing for Mr. Ford to run on. Like the $6 million man even gets an electricity subsidy. I don't know why the other parties are unwilling to talk about this, but Steve, if you look at most of these, so when it comes to electricity subsidies and when it comes to the license sticker rebates, wealthy households receive a disproportionately high uh, part of the benefit and lower and middle income households receive a lower proportion of the benefit. And it's nothing against wealthy individuals. I want people to be successful in Ontario. I want to be really clear about that. But right now, we clearly need to make some investments in, our, in improving our public services, making housing more affordable, preparing ourselves for the climate emergency. And I think we need some tax fairness uh, to ensure that wealthier individuals uh, aren't getting subsidized <laughs> when there are literally people in Ontario right now who can't afford to own a home. You made a little news here for me, incidentally, in as much as when Peter Weltman, the financial accountability mm -hmm. officer, was on the program when we talked about this, he said an MPP asked me to do the study, but he wouldn't tell me who. It's you. <laughs> it was me. You were the one who asked. Okay, <laughs> good to know. I want to know uh, about, uh, let me put it this way. You were first out the gate, I think, in terms of offering the public a break on transit fares, offering yes. to reduce the cost of riding transit for, uh, by 50% uh, for three months. But then the Liberals got out there with buck a ride province-wide, which you got to admit sounds a lot sexier. And I wonder whether you think they have superseded and bypassed your plan as a result. We're prioritizing um, solutions over slogans, quite frankly. So first of all, I really want to ask the Liberals to do their math on the accounting on that because somehow ours cutting it in half, we've costed it as costing the province more than them to going to buck a ride. So either we're overestimating how much it's going to cost or they're underestimating how much it's going to well, cost. Well, they've said $700 million the first year and a billion the second yeah. year. And then our costing is $1.2 billion a year to cut them in half. That, that's what we got so working with transit agents. So I, th I think they're underestimating the cost. But mm. that aside, there are two things that factor in people using transit. So one is affordability, which I believe we're addressing and the Liberals are addressing as well. The other one is service and reliability. And if you drain too many resources out of the system, then you look at service and reliability cutbacks, which deter people from taking transit. Our goal is to triple transit use by 2030. And in order to do that, we're gonna to have to ramp up investment, not only in expanding transit services through LRTs and subways and all of that, but also in the most fiscally responsible and quickest way, which we're the only ones talking about doing, is dedicated bus lines. The fastest way to really ramp up transit, particularly inner city transit, is through buses. So for example, you know, I live in Guelph. It's 2022, I cannot take a bus from Guelph to Kitchener-Waterloo. Guelph to Hamilton, Guelph to Cambridge, Guelph to Brantford. I can't get an express bus to Toronto. I mean, that makes absolutely no sense to me. So it's going to take investment to ensure that we expand services and we also have to make sure those services are reliable because if you're paying a dollar and you're waiting 45 minutes for a bus, you're not a happy person. Right. If you're paying half price and you're waiting 10 minutes for that bus, I think you're a happier person. Okay. We got a few minutes to go here and I want to just, uh, a few political questions um, before we finish up. Annamie Paul was the leader of the federal Greens. 
and she made quite a name for herself uh, trying to get that party. Anyway, we won't go into the ancient history here. Suffice to say, I remember there was a moment where I thought maybe the two of you were going to have a conversation to see whether she would run for you in this election. Did that conversation take place? You know what? I've had conversations with Anna Mee just post her federal political career. She made it very clear to me that um, she needs a break from politics, and I fully respect that. And uh, so I did not ask her to run, uh, but she made it very clear to me before I even had a chance to have that conversation that she needed a break from politics. So that was not on regardless. <laughs> okay, got it. Second thing is, um, okay, let's go to Perry San Muskoka here. Because you're the one Green MPP, and you mentioned in the debate last night that if people living in Perry San Muskoka are watching this, vote for your guy, because <laughs> I guess you think Matt Richter's got the second best chance to be the second Green MPP there. There's no liberal running in that riding because their candidate had to drop out. I'm betting you're going to get a good chunk of that liberal vote that would otherwise have gone to them. But that's one of the safest Tory seats <laughs> in the whole province. They got more than 50% of the votes there last time. So the, and the, your guy in the last election got 20%. That's a big amount of ground to make up. Can you really win that seat? Well, you know what? 2018 in Guelph feels a lot like 22, uh, 2022 in Perry Sound, Muskoka. A lot of people in Guelph said Mike Schreiner won't win because Guelph is a safe liberal seat until it wasn't a safe liberal seat. Mm -hmm. And the momentum Mac Richter has right now, um, I, I've been um, really struck by the actually level of anger from folks around this whole license sticker gimmick thing where people are saying to Matt, you know what, here's my $120. I've yeah. never voted green, but, uh, but we want politicians to come out here and earn our vote, not buy our vote. And uh, there's a lot of people who um, in that riding who are struggling around finding an affordable place to call home. And our housing affordability strategy really speaks to, to, to those folks. A lot of people, particularly in the tourism industry that have been hit hard by the pandemic and our steadfast support for supporting small businesses and ensuring they get the supports they need. You know, for instance, Mr. Ford, you know, in the pandemic left big box stores open and close small businesses. Like never again should we allow that to happen. And so having a Green Party that's championing climate action, championing housing affordability, championing support for small businesses and the people who, you know, live in writings like Perry Sound Muskoka and across the province, uh, we're feeling momentum, I think, especially coming out of our debate performance last night, but we have other great candidates. Diane Sachs here in University Rosedale. I look at Carla Johnson in Cambridge, Laura Campbell and Dufferin Caledon, strong candidates all across the province that we're really excited about. That's Mike Schreiner. He's the leader of the Green Party, seeking votes and re-election in the riding of Guelph. Thanks for coming into TVO tonight and doing this with us. We appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure, Steve. Anytime. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.